Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, God, as we, we come together and we recognize yet again who you say we are. God, as we ask that question, who am I? Lord, we come to your word, we come to you seeking that answer. Lord, no longer allowing the experiences that we've had in the week, no longer allowing those voices on our own minds to define us, God. Instead, we are looking to you. We are looking to you with expectancy. We are looking to you in faith, knowing that you proclaim over us that we are loved. God, that we are a part of your family. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. When I sit down and I start my, my prep on Sundays, I always start with the same sentence. I sometimes don't say it to you, but if you look at my notes, it, it's always the same thing that I have written down. It's always, good morning, Wood Street Chapel family. That, that's what I, I kind of use to just get myself in the rhythm of, okay, I'm, I'm doing sermon prep now. And that just triggers my brain to say, okay, this is what we're doing. And this morning, it, it was a fit because today we're going to be talking about family. We're going to be talking about that we are part of the body of Christ. Why do more than two billion people attend church worldwide? What are the benefits? If someone were to ask us, why do we go to church? Sometimes it's hard to think of an answer other than, well, it's Sunday and that's what I do. So often you hear about people that want to go out into the wilderness, that people that want to go out and, and spend time alone. They want to spend time in creation. You, you hear about believers that want to do this. They just want to go out and, and be alone in creation. And, and so what if somebody does that? So somebody says, you know, I don't need to, to, to do church with everyone else. I, I, it's just a me and God thing. And so I like going out into the wilderness. I like going out there and seeing God's creation and, and being able to spend that time alone. Okay, that's fine. And, and, and I go out and I, I decide that I'm going to do that. And I'm going to just, instead of participating in the body of Christ, instead of coming and, and being part of the church body, I decide I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this by myself. I'm going to go out in creation. And there I am in the middle of creation, not a soul around for 100 miles. And I break my leg. What happens? Nothing good. <laughs> Nothing good happens. I'm hoping we can connect the dots a little bit here. Maybe I'm not just talking about going out into the wilderness. Maybe this has a little bit more to do with our, our hearts if we're saying, hey, I don't need the people here. I can do life just fine on my own. What happens when you break your spiritual leg? What happens when there is a need that exists in your life and, and you don't have a support network around you, a, a body that is holding you up. If we take a look at Ephesians chapter one, starting at verse 18, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. It is incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. There was a little boy whose parents had passed away. He was five years old. The authorities looked and couldn't find a relative for him. So the next few years, he, he lived in an orphanage. He was, was placed in an orphanage with other children that were in, in the same situation the people that, that worked in the, the orphanage were nice enough. But as you can imagine, there's a profound sense of loneliness. 
a profound sense of loss when you don't have your family. It was the only thing the boy thought about day after day after day is, is the family that he had lost. And, and he would watch as, as other p- people would come and, and be introduced to children at the orphanage and they would be taken and they would, they would have new lives and they would have new families and he would cry out, what about me? What about my family? What, what about what I used to have? This isn't fair that I'm going through this in my life. His months turned into to years, turned into multiple years. The, the loneliness just became familiar. It never went away. It was just something that, that became familiar in his life and, and something that he just learned to deal with. Time after time, he would see people come visiting the orphanage, meeting and it being introduced to children. Sometimes they would be introduced, uh, grown-ups would be introduced to him and He was never taken home. He was never given a family. And the boy began to believe that it just was never going to happen. He began to accept that this was just reality. This is what it was going to be for him. And one day as as the little boy was, was out with some of the other children in the orphanage and they were doing a fundraiser in a, a community center, a couple looked at him. And, and he was trying to focus on the things that he was doing, but he couldn't help but notice that this couple wouldn't stop looking at him. After the event was done, they, they rushed over and, and talked to the director of the, the program. But nothing came of it. He went back to the orphanage. He he didn't hear from the director. He didn't hear from this couple that seemed so interested in him. He was was so excited for just a moment, and then he had to remind himself, well, good things don't happen to me. That was silly of me to get my hopes up for, for just that moment. Over the next few di- days, his, his mind kept on going back to that moment, wondering just what that could have been, until eventually the, the director does call him into his office, and, and there as he walks in is the, the, this couple that was looking so closely at them. You see, when the couple looked at the program for his, his performance, they saw his first and last name, and they realized this is family. They were a distant relation, a cousin of a cousin of his parents who had passed away, someone who was not reachable just through change of address and change of of phone number, but through sheer coincidence, they happened to be in that space, and they happened to be trying to have children, and they were unsuccessful at doing so. And it just so happened that they had been considering adoption until they saw this little boy. And they asked the little boy, will you be part of this family? And out of sadness, out of hardship, out of loneliness, a family emerges. Sometimes we as followers of Christ, we as members of a church body forget what it means to be part of a family. Most of us, upon hearing a story like that, say, well, well, isn't that sweet? Isn't that wonderful that 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 little boy had that experience? The reminder for us today is that is exactly our story. Because sin exists in this world, because the human condition leads us to sin, because we are are programmed and prone to sin because of 
sin existing in this world, our natural state is to be separated from God. But God showed up. He showed up in the midst of our loneliness, in the midst of our despair, in the midst of our brokenness, where we thought things just could never get any better, where we thought we don't deserve to be happy. We don't deserve to be saved. God showed up and he said, you will be part of my family. Is church really supposed to be a family? Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. It's Paul talking to the Ephesians church. If you look in the New Testament in most of the standard translations, this is maybe one of the only translations that actually uses the word family to describe the church. We probably shouldn't base our argument off of a single verse <laughs> in the Bible, but, but I would say that there might be, just maybe, some additional supporting arguments that we could make here. The church is to be the household of God. If you do a search through a concordance, you'll see that the word household is mentioned 26 times in the New Testament. And it refers to everyone who lives within the, the person's house, usually pointing to a specific family. Ephesians 2, 19, Paul told the Ephesians who were Gentiles that they were no longer strangers to God's covenant, but members of the household of God. In Galatians 6.10, Paul tells the Christians to do good to all, but to give special emphasis to doing good things for those who are in the household of faith. There is a household. And when a child is adopted, at one point, that child and this couple that we talked about this morning, they are total and complete strangers. But after that adoption, they are now family. That is the idea for the followers of Christ. We have been adopted by God, and now we are part of a family. The church is a family of, the word that the Bible uses typically is brethren, because it's it's male focused but we can say it's a family of brothers and sisters in Christ that particular word is found 191 times in the new king james version in acts 15:36 it says paul and barnabas visited many cities as they preached the gospel paul's view of these new converts when he talks about them, he calls them brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2.11, how did we come to be brothers and sisters? Because there is one who sanctified us. We were born into God's family because of his sacrifice. Because of what Jesus Christ did, we are now brothers and sisters. Philemon 15, 16 says, an amazing change. It discusses an, an amazing transition. The slave Onesimus was once a, a servant or a slave to Philemon. And Paul writes to Philemon, his, his student, his pupil, and he says, Onesimus used to be a slave, but now he's your brother. Can you imagine that transition? It's one thing to talk about adoption because we, we get adoption. We, we kind of understand how that works in Western culture. It's something entirely different to try and wrap your head around what it means to go from being a slave in the
the Eastern culture to now being a brother. It's not like it was being a slave in the South. That's not the type of slavery that was talked about here. This is something totally different. This is completely just part of who that person was, part of who that family line was. They were born into this. In Matthew 19, 29, when we leave everything to follow Christ, we receive an abundance of blessing. When we leave the, the earthly blessings that, that we, we cling to, we, we see heavenly blessings that become available, and a new family is one of those blessings. Why should we value the church as our family? If we go back to our example this morning of the little boy who is adopted into a family, is he really adopted into a family if, if after he makes the decision to move forward with this process, the, the husband and wife never speak kindly to him ever again? If after he goes through with that process, he's never provided for. If after that process, he's never really loved. Is he really part of a family? Maybe legally. But in his mind, do you think he's necessarily saying, well, this, this feels like a family. This feels like I've come home. No. In this family... There are people who, who welcome you. Acts 2, 28, 13 through 15. For Paul, this was a difficult time. He was a prisoner. He was being sent to Rome to, to stand trial in front of Caesar. As he was going, he, he would stop at people's houses that he had never met before, but because they were followers of Christ, they welcomed him as family. In this family, there are people who will protect you. After Paul was converted to Christ, he, he began preaching the gospel boldly, so boldly that the, the Jewish religious leaders were desperate to find a way to kill him. And instead of allowing that to happen, allowing this, honestly, this guy who they really didn't have a whole lot of great relationship with before because he was trying to kill, them, to kill the other believers before, instead they, they smuggle him out the back door and they lower him down over the city walls, and he's saved, he's rescued, he's protected because he's a part of the body of Christ. In this family, there are people of peace. If you look at Abraham, We've been looking a lot at Paul and his life, but if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis in, in chapter 13, verse 8, this idea of Abraham speaking to Lot, uh, speaking about the importance of there being peace between us. Why does that matter? Why couldn't they just go their separate ways? It matters because they're family. And when there's family, there's to be peace within family. Have you ever been in a family situation? I don't need you to raise your hand. I don't need you to, this is not a time to overshare. Have you ever been in a family situation where there hasn't been peace? Cynthia, don't laugh. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation where, where maybe a brother and a sister are, are not getting along. 
Have there, there ever been a situation where, where adult siblings don't get along, where, where maybe it's, it's nephews or, or cousins or, or whatever that relationship is and there's not peace? When you're a part of that situation, when you are observing it and not necessarily involved, you can absolutely feel the tension. You can feel it in your gut almost. And there's a longing to be able to just bring everyone involved together and say, there needs to be peace. What needs to happen so that there is peace in this situation in this relationship because we are a family in this family there are people who have unconditional love for you we always the the church likes to talk about agape love. We know we talk about these different types of love and, and agape love is this unconditional love, this love that says, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you have done. I don't care how you smell, what work you do, what clothes you're wearing. I love you because God loves you. My goal, when I come to this place and and I'm around you people here in this time, in this moment, is to have that kind of love for you. For every single one of you, for every person that I, I come in contact with, my goal is to have that kind of unconditional love because that's what God says I'm supposed to have. I don't get it right all the time. Sometimes the words that I say, sometimes the things that I do, do a really bad job of communicating unconditional love. But the fact of the matter is I love you because you are a part of my family. In John 3, 16, we see the perfect example of this love. For God so loved the world that he was willing to die for you. He was willing to give his son to come to earth to live a sinless life, to be separated from him, for the sin of the world to come upon him and for him to die on a cross, a sinner's death to be buried in a tomb that wasn't his, to be raised again, to make a way for us to be with him for all of eternity. That is love. Sometimes when, when I think about that process, it's, it's easy to kind of think, well, that's God. He's supposed to love that way. And then you kind of start thinking about, try, maybe try to put yourself in God's place. And that's a, a dangerous thing to do, but just go with me for just a minute. What would it be like if I gave my only son? And, and that was what was going to address the sin of the world. And not only did I give my only son, but my only son went willingly. Obviously, it can't work that way because I'm not God. But when you stop and put yourself into that, into that mindset for just a moment to think about this is the, the feeling. Maybe that God went through. Some, some form of that. Now, I can't begin to fathom the depth of God's emotions, the depth of, of what God feels and what God says. That's, that's way beyond me, and that's way beyond anything that we're going to know here on this earth. But it's good for us to value the sacrifice that was made for us.
There is no church on earth where every Christian practices all of the things that I just talked about. There's not. There is not a a day that goes by where, where I get to check every single one of these things off the list saying, yep, I successfully did everything that it means to be a Christian today. just doesn't work that way. There, there are things that we need to do better. There are thoughts that we need to think differently. There are words that we need to say differently. There are relationships that we're called to, to put work into differently. But in the body of Christ, it's a group of people that are working through that process. It is a group of people that are being, being saved. It's called sanctification. It is the process of God doing work in my life. And every day that goes by where I say, Holy Spirit, I invite you into this place, into this moment, into my life, and I ask that you would be effective, that you would be made known in the words that I say, that you would be made known in the work that I do, Help me to be more like you as I go through my days. If this church is my family, then I should be developing relationships within it. There should not be an instance where we say this church is our family and someone has been attending this church for two years and we have no idea what their name is. Ooh. There should not be an instance where somebody is coming to this place and we don't know who they are. We, we have a responsibility to know, not just in these four walls, but in the body of Christ. We need relationship. We need relationship because we can't be in those situations where we're 100 miles from no one and we break our spiritual leg. What happens when, when we get into that situation of, of desperate need where, where there's brokenness that's happening in our life, where there's something that is causing a problem and, and we're crying out to God and, and God hears the prayers of, of his people even when there's out of the church body, but what are we missing out on? as we talked through that story of that little boy being adopted. What a beautiful thing to take place, right? What, what an awesome opportunity for, for a child who has nothing, a child that is lonely, that is broken, that is hurting, to be brought into being a part of a family. If that is truly something that we say, yeah, that's beautiful, that's amazing, that's exactly what we want to see happen, then that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to bring people into the family of God. We're supposed to say, hey, there is a way that you can be adopted, you can have this family. And yet so often I find myself in instances where I'm talking to that orphan who is lonely, who has lost their family, who is in all ways broken, and yet I don't make that available to them. Because maybe I just don't think about it in the moment. Maybe it's, I'm worried about what they're going to say. Maybe I'm, I'm worried about what they're going to think of me. But who am I to hold that back? Ephesians 2.19, the, the choice before us is clear. We get to either be strangers and foreigners, or we can accept God's offer to become members of the household of God. What a blessing.
there was a, a question that was asked, why is the church the most important group on earth? You have to be careful when you start answering a question like that. Is you start maybe getting a little bit of a big head. <laughs> the first answer was that the church is, is God's family. And because it's God's family, it's the most important group on earth. Okay. The, the second re- reason that was given is that it's the reason that God created the universe. That's true. Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. And this gave him great pleasure. Ephesians 1.5 That was his plan, and because that was his plan, that the world was created so that we could be part of his family. The church is the most important group on earth because God is using his church for his eternal purposes. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11 says that God's intent is was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to all the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purposes which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why is the church the most important group on earth? Because Jesus Christ died for his church. Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. He died so that he could give the church to himself like a bride in all her beauty. He died so that the church could be pure and without fault. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. The church is the only thing on earth that will last forever. Glory will belong to God in his church and in Christ Jesus for all time and eternity. Ephesians three twenty one. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, we will be with the Lord together forever. It's the only group that Jesus ever said would succeed. I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. It is the only group big enough to solve global problems. By his mighty power at work within us, God is able to accomplish infinitely more than we would ever dare to ask or hope. There's only one way that this statement that the church is the most important group on earth works. And there's a very important prerequisite to that statement working, and that is that Christ has to be the center of the church. We can't leave this place today talking about all of the the things that are on us to, to do as far as being part of the body of Christ. We can't talk about all of the things that are important for me to say and important for you to say, important for us to think and do without acknowledging that Christ has to be in the middle of it all. And while I appreciate this intent of, of the, these questions of, of talking about the church as being the most important group on earth, we have to be careful that we, we don't let that create pride where there shouldn't be. All of these things that, that are stated are true. They, they come directly from the word of God. They are true They are true when Christ is at the center. If, if I just show up and, and with my own agenda, with my own great ideas and say, I know how the church is going to solve global problems, come with me, just run away, okay? Just don't participate in that. That's not anything that is going to be helpful to anyone. 
We have to rely on God in these situations. So this question, who am I? I'm a child of God. I've been adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. I have. You have. Each of us separately, individually, hand-picked. It wasn't like there was just like a a six billion to one sale and he's just like, all right, we'll just take the group. No, he, he came and he, he died on a cross. He, he spread his arms. He, he took nails through his arms and his feet. He took a beating for you, specifically. And it's so easy to, to just think, well, it was just for the world at large. Yes, it was, but it was for you. It was for me. He knew my name. He was speaking my name in the midst of that sacrifice. Before I was even born and walking this earth, he was singing blessing over me because I'm part of his family. You are part of his family. Wood Street Chapel family. In the, the midst of this season where, where it is so easy to, to make the jump from, well, we, we aren't meeting together anymore because of, of COVID and everything else, and that's, I'm not even going to have that level of conversation right now. I, I completely understand the, the need to make decisions that protect your family and that protect your health. I, I get that. But it's so easy to jump from a place of, of well, maybe I can watch online or I can just check in and, and do church a different way to then all of a sudden maybe saying, well, maybe I, I can just go and, and be by myself and, and do church this way. Maybe I don't necessarily need to be a part of the family of God. I hope this morning that, that this has, has maybe pointed out that there is value, not just for you, There is value to to the other members of the body of Christ when we are all together. This is not a guilt trip for anybody that's watching at home right now. Okay, don't don't start taking it that way. That's not anything like this. This is an encouragement to us to recognize that it is important that we be together. It is important regardless of how many people we have sitting in this room. If there are 10 of us that are sitting here in this room this morning, then, then th- there is value in doing life with one another. If there turns out to be 100 of us sitting here in this room, there is still value in us doing life together. One of the things that, that I have learned as I have been a manager and a director of, of people, of, of team members that are under me, I have recognized that there is a, a extreme importance in getting that group of people out of their everyday life, the, the normal things that they are doing, and instead focusing on what it means to do life outside of the workplace. As soon as you do that, there are new relationships that are created. There is all of a sudden an understanding of, hey, that person that bothers me in this one area of their work is actually a real person, is a person that has a family, is a person that likes things and dislikes things, and maybe I should recognize them as a person as opposed to just the, the entity that's on the other side of the phone that keeps annoying me. And I would submit to you that maybe we can extend that to the body of Christ. Maybe we can extend that to the body of Christ and say that there is a value to seeing how people do life outside of the four walls of this church. 
Maybe there is value to recognizing that just because that person sings off key doesn't mean that every other aspect of their life is, is incredibly frustrating and annoying to you. Sorry, I know none of you guys sing off key. That's just a terrible example. Um, maybe it's important for us to recognize that outside of these four walls, we're still family. And if that's the case, I shouldn't be talking bad about my family. If that's the case, I should be building up my family. If that's the case, I should be wanting only the best for my family. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come to you, God, we thank you that we are a part of your family. God, that we have been adopted as children of the King. God, what an awesome privilege that we can come and we can, can call you Father God. God, thank you that you selected every single person in this room, that you handpicked each of us with intentionality, that you handpicked every single one knowing who we were, knowing the mistakes that we would make, knowing the things that we would say that you would just cringe from, and yet you never pulled your hand away. God, thank you that you have selected us to be part of your family. And God, because you have selected us, help us to love one another. Help us to exhibit what it means to be a part of the family of God. God, help me to love my brothers and my sisters unconditionally. Help me to be an instrument of peace in the lives of these people. God, help me to speak healing where there needs to be healing. Help me to speak restoration and joy where there needs to be joy. God, help me to strengthen. Lord, as we leave this place, don't let us leave this place the same. Let us leave this place recognizing that we have an opportunity, an opportunity because you have called us sons and daughters of God. Help us to extend that invitation, that opportunity for adoption to those that so desperately need it. Help us to see past the, the things that would, would stop us from being able to share that information, to being able to share that good news, that gospel, and to instead say, hey, you have an opportunity this morning to become a child of God. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.